Thanks. Thanks, everybody, so much for coming. We really appreciate having all of you here. We appreciate everyone who's joining us virtually on Zoom. It's an incredible honor and pleasure to have Fiona Hill here today. Thank you all for joining us for the latest of our installment in conversations with Yevgenia Albats. I'm going to turn it over to Jenya, our distinguished journalist in residence here at the Jordan Center for the 2022-2023 academic year to introduce our guest further. But thank you all so much for being here. We're really, really looking forward to the conversation with Fiona. Thank you so much for, coming, you. for joining us. Jenya? Josh, thank you so much. And good afternoon, everybody. And whether you're here in you New can, you, the microphone. In why use Jordan Center for Advanced Study of Russia, whether you're on uh, Zoom or anywhere in the world. I know that people are watching us in the United States and also in Russia. So we have quite an audience of those who are interested. And of course, they are. Because today we have, you know, in the sixth event of QA series and conversation uh, with me, we have absolutely amazing guests. Uh, we have uh, Fiona Hill. Uh, Fiona, hi. Very nice. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. And I, I should say that um, we know each other, of course, since we were Harvard alumni. But the most important that um, Fiona Hill, I'm sorry? Uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Fiona Hill, uh, has been, was an advisor to three presidents of the United States. I especially look, uh, looked in at George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, and she was advising them on foreign policy issues, including questions related to Russia and Eurasia, among many, many others. She was a national intelligence officer. She authored and co-authored four or five books. Whenever I have a chance to teach in, you know, whether in the United States and Russia, I always assigned her book, co-authored with Clifford Getty, which is titled, Mr. Putin, a creative in Kremlin as a must to read. And it is a must to read. Uh, she met Putin in person and knows uh, his in and outs. I would, I would not say intimately, but close to that. Uh, yet the book of hers I like the most is her latest book, and it's titled, There is Nothing for You Here. This is the title of her 2021 book, but it's also a quote of, uh, from her grandfather, who advised her, a girl from the poorest part of England, from the miners' region at the northeast of England, to get up out of the bishop coffer. The way to get out and to make a career to the very top of the world politics uh, for her was uh, through the education. That's what she describes in this absolutely amazing book. It is an extremely powerful book and I read the book with amazement and disbelief. I never realized how deeply Fiona knows the life of poverty from which most of us Soviet people came. And now I understand why she feels so related to my part of the world and to my country and she, it's you can study Russia, you can study Soviet Union, but you have to live through certain things that she lived and I lived. And I perfectly understand what she is uh, writing about precisely because, you know, we in a way have uh, similar stories. So, uh, and I, I should tell you, I was absolutely stunned to see just a week ago when we already were preparing this uh, interview I read that Durham University, Durham? Durham, yeah. Durham. Ah, so H is per right? Yeah. Durham. Durham University, you, the university from her county in England, named uh, her a daughter of a minor and a nurse as its next chancellor. Congratulations, Fiona. Oh, thanks. This post was introduced in, in uh, Durham, uh, Durham University in 1832. It's England now. Right, you know, everything's <laughs> about tradition, tradition, tradition. So, and uh, I would strongly advise those of you, and especially you know, young people who think about career and humanities, to read uh, Fiona's book. Because she describes in this book what was it like for her without having books, without having money for books, without having money to take a bus to go to places where these books were available. 
you know, living in her tiny little uh, town, abandoned mines, you know, it's, if you go to uh, north of Pennsylvania, here you see the cities like that, towns like that here. So how, you know, and she managed to go to the university. She had this very strong accent. I remember you know, when we met at Harvard first, you know, I remember her accent. I, I studied British English at school in Moscow, but I couldn't understand, you know, most of the part at the beginning. It took me time to get a customer. And she describes in this book what a problem it was because, you know, of course, you know, United Kingdom was a very class oriented society. So uh, once again, congratulations, Fiona. And I understand that this is a ceremonial president. So still, what is your take on this chancellorship? Are you planning on sharing your time between Brookings? Of course, you know, Fiona Hill is a senior, uh, 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 what? Senior fellow. Senior fellow, yeah, senior, fellow. senior fellow. Senior yeah. fellow, yes, senior fellow at Brookings Institute in it's one of the best think tanks in Washington, D.C. So are you, going, are you planning on sharing your time between Brookings and uh, Durham, uh, Durham from now on? Uh, well, beginning in June, I'll be going back there on a regular basis. And uh, look, the, the position, as it's an honorary position, is really focused on using this as a platform to encourage people to enter into education. The Chancellor presides over many of the graduations. And um, you know, Durham University is one of the older universities in England after Oxford and Cambridge. Scottish universities I went to undergraduate in St Andrews in Scotland are actually older. Um, Scotland always had a you know, very strong emphasis on education. Um, but you know, the uh, university itself of Durham um, is uh, not as connected as it could be to the region around it. And I'm succeeding um, actually a baritone opera singer uh, called Thomas Allen, Sir Thomas Allen who was the model for um, the play Billy Elliot that later became a film, although that's about a ballet dancer. But um, he was the inspiration for the playwright Lee Hall, as you know, basically a kid from a working class background, you know, years back, he's in his seventies now, um, in the, the same region who wanted to become an opera singer and nobody had any idea about how he was uh, going to do that. And so his story became, you know, somewhat legendary. So I'm the sort of second person from um, the region to become the chancellor. It previously had been um, Margot Fontaine, the, the famous ballet dancer of Sadler Wells, Peter Ustinov, famous you know, Russian uh, born um, actor. And before that, members of the aristocracy and owners of the coal fields that my family used to work in. So there's a kind of you know, strange and interesting arc. But all I can say is to the students here, you never know how things are gonna turn out. And sometimes when you're the first in your uh, family to go to university, which you know, a lot of people here at NYU um, others are, you know, unexpected uh, things happen because you have no blueprint, you have no model. And one of the things I'd like to do um, with this position is, um, you know, go out and beat the drum about the importance of education in all forms. I'm, I'm actually, you know, relieved to see older people, you know, here as well because uh, education is a lifelong, uh, a lifelong um, thing, right? And I've done, we always have to think about how we reskill, you know, how we adapt ourselves. My father um, was only uh, trained to be in the coal mines. So when the mines closed, he didn't know what else to do. He didn't have another profession. He didn't have skills and uh, training. So he became a hospital, 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 hospital porter. Yeah, and all the mother was a nurse. And as my dad said, you know, that wasn't. You didn't need professional training for that. You just sort of showed up, and they asked you to, you know, do certain things. Where you were trained as a miner, or you know, you trained in a steelworks and a shipyard in heavy industry. The linkage, uh, before we get on to you know, talking about what everyone's here really to talk about, about Putin and you know, Ukraine, everything that's happening here, there's a couple of really interesting linkages I want to just leave everybody with here. One of the reasons why I decided to study Russia in the first place and also you know, write this particular book is that I think you know, some people here will know this, but after World War II, all heavy industry in Britain was nationalized. So it was all run by the state, which didn't happen in the United States after World War II because there was still enough capital in the system. And the United States had been a big market. Uh, it wasn't also cut off uh, from uh, the rest of the world in the way that Britain was for the five years of World War II. And the British economy essentially was devastated. And all the private owners, they couldn't revive uh, their companies afterwards. And all of the coal fields were run by the church, by local aristocrats. Uh, and eventually, you know, the same with the shipyards and the steelworks, you know, for example. And so the state had to step in. And you know, they, they weren't particularly profitable after a whole period. The 1960s onwards is a kind of, you know, basically a period of decline in all of these nationalized industries. And in the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher comes into power in 1979, 
she undergoes a mass privatization. And the northeast of England, because it was the heartland of the Industrial Revolution, pretty much every business there was run by the state. And I didn't know anybody really, apart from people who owned a small shop or maybe a small plumbing or other business who worked in the private sector. And so suddenly overnight, you had mass unemployment. We had 50% unemployment in my town. When I left, the, you know, the term was actually my father said to me, there's nothing for you here. When I left school in 1984, 90% youth unemployment. And only 10% of um, kids uh, were really going to university because there was limited uh, place at that point because um, you know, there wasn't the, the mass expansion of education just like you know, there uh, has been here as well since that time frame. So the north of England was a very particular place. And when I first went to the Soviet Union in 1987, I was struck by how similar it was. And then in the 1990s, you know, when we met and uh, Russia was undergoing shock therapy beginning in 1992, I was struck by the similarities where suddenly the bottom came out of everything. And although some people still had their jobs, you know, the, the whole industry collapsed and fell apart because it wasn't well positioned for the private sector. And all of the things that you've studied and all the things that everybody else has been looking at really come from that period. And the populist politics emerge out of this, the grievances uh, of the, the people who've lost their jobs and also their identities. My father always thought of himself as a coal miner, even though for decades he wasn't. You know, but, but that was the whole way that he thought of himself, just as in the Soviet Union when people lost their jobs and the country had uh, you know, basically disappeared on them. There was that whole kind of sense of being cast adrift. And of course, that's what Putin uh, has played into. And um, populist politics in the UK, Brexit, uh, the rise of you know, the United Kingdom Independence Party and all these other things that we've seen in Britain you know, recently, even the mass change in prime ministers over the last five minutes, you know, every time there's a new prime minister in Britain, <laughs> which is kind of unusual, but it's kind of a, a manifestation of some of these long trends of these problems. And regional inequalities, which has persisted for decades, since the 1980s, the north of England is still the poorest part of Britain, 50% um, childhood poverty in some of uh, the towns, and no um, uh, basically redevelopment. And one of the um, other you know, fun facts that again links into what we're here to talk about is that my region has been twinned with Donbass since the 1920s. So uh, beginning in 1926, Durham coal miners got invited, and you know, one might say it was all part of the propaganda exercise, to go and visit show uh, mines in Donbass. Uh, Donetsk, the, um, the capital of uh, the uh, Donbass region, used to be called Huzovka because it was developed in the uh, late 19th century by actually a Welsh um, investor, and Welsh miners were brought in to set up these mines. So you, you kind of forget that uh, Donbass is like the northeast of England, or it's like the the industrial heartland of the Midwest, often developed by the same foreign entrepreneurs and capitalists who invested there. And then when the Bolshevik Revolution comes around, it's all nationalized. These mines become the showcases and everyone's getting invited over in the late Bolshevik and Stalin period to sort of see how it's all done in this socialist paradise. And anyway, the Durham miners kind of cottoned on that perhaps everything wasn't as, as wonderful um, as, it, as it could have been. But if you fast forward then to 1984, the year that I'm leaving school, it was the miners' strike in the United Kingdom. That's the backdrop for the film and you know, the play Billy Elliot as well. And uh, the miners of County Durham and miners across the whole of uh, Britain were, were basically on strike for almost two full years. And you know, basically without any pay whatsoever. And miners around the world, miners' unions and associations sent the money, including the miners of Donbass. And I was um, wanting to go to university to study Russian, but I'd never had Russian in school. It wasn't available in schools in my town. And I had to go on an intensive Russian language course. And you're guessing where this ends up, right? I got the money from the miners of Donbass <laughs> to go and study Russian uh, in the University of East Anglia for a summer. Uh, and it was handed to me in a little envelope, um, not in rubles, uh, but in uh, you know, pounds. Cash? In cash. When I went to the local Durham Miners Association office, and I was asked to fill in a form. My dad had to come with me to you know, show his old miners uh, you know, documentation of being a miner. And it was the most incredible you know, small grant I've ever had. They gave me a hundred pounds in, um, I remember in five and 10 pound notes to pay for you know, my bus fare, my train fare and you know, to the fees uh, and um, you know, kind of my living expenses while I was on this intensive Russian language course. And I mean, I'll never forget that moment, but obviously I owe a big uh, vote of thanks to the miners of Donbass, who let's just say in a pretty nasty predicament right now. But it's just one of these you know, ironies of the old socialist and you know, labor movements. You Remind know, me what your grandfather said when you started, you know, basically he, I, and if I remember properly, he directed you to the Soviet studies. 
It was actually my great uncle. My oh, great uncle. Yeah, yeah, my okay. great uncle who said, go and figure out why the Soviets are trying to bloody well blow us up. This is in the 1980s during the war scares. And Hillary needs us to talk more closely into the mic, what right? I All right, so you're getting messages from people in Zoom saying we can't oh, hear it's, anything? It's, it, they can hear you, but it's just muffled. Okay, so they're all kind of listening very, Sorry, uh, I don't very mean, closely. I hate to interrupt, but I'm just going so to increase the mic. What should we do? You don't need to do anything. I'm going to increase the mic. Okay. Okay. That's okay, you know. Hopefully it now won't be like they're getting yelled at in Zoom as well, right? That was actually that was actually also my father and grandfather's approach to, you know, anybody who didn't speak English, just yell at them. They obviously be deaf. <laughs> <laughs> Why accent was such an issue in the United Kingdom? I, you know, I know it's you always, when you come to France, you understand that if you don't speak French, you have a little bit of trouble. But when I've been so many times to the United States, I speak with a heavy uh, East European accent. And I usually, I don't have any problems here. Why it is such an issue in Great Britain? Well, I think it actually exists here in the United States, right? I mean, really? people will probably tell the same thing, that there are certain regional accents that are associated in people's minds with certain stereotypes. And in England, particularly because the North was the bastion of uh, basically heavy industry and workers working in big heavy industry, steel workers, you know, coal miners, shipyard uh, workers, there was an association of that particular accent with the working class. So, you know, you immediately, if you spoke with a Northern accent, even if, you know, your father was a doctor or, you know, your, your parents were actually maybe even landowners, uh, there would be an assumption if you had that accent that you were unlikely in that kind of capacity that you were a worker, a working class. It was kind of guilt by association from that particular accent. There are other accents that are associated with that. Think of the Beatles. You know, they had a, a from Liverpool, and their accent was Scouse or East London, the Cockney accent. Uh, so there's lots of areas that are associated with the working class. So that particular accent is seen as a marker of class and who you are and who you're likely to be. And look, and I think we can come up with very similar examples in the United States as well. You know, and obviously there's regional accents in many other countries as well. And, and in the you know, uh, Russia and the Soviet Union as well in the day, Gorbachev had fun made of him because he was from Stavropol. Yes, but he had the southern of, accent. The southern accent, Very people nice, would notice you know? it. Yeah, but people would notice that accent yeah. and immediately make an association. I remember there used to be a lot of memes about Gorbachev and people making fun of the way that he spoke. Right, that Brezhnev also had, you know, yeah, the southern accent. Yeah. So you see, there were, yeah. there, there's kind of accents in other um, uh, contexts and people think of them as about specific regions. And, and here in the United States, there's, you know, also specific accents that are associated with different groups. But in the England, particular accent could be a marker of class. Is it still so? Yes, um, actually, there's been a recent reports done by a number of um, uh, you know, NGOs and uh, research groups that show that accent is still a mark of class in the United Kingdom, even though you'd think it would change. Uh, and it has changed over time. And, um, you know, kind of the accent that I have is very common among com comedians and, you know, actors and things, but not so common, you know, in uh, political circles or, you know, in universities. And I am actually speaking with my dad's telephone voice. We used to make fun of my father uh, when he'd get on the telephone. And we said, why are you talking like that? Because nobody will understand me otherwise. So I'm speaking in the enunciated version of the Northern England accent. Really? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Because okay. you couldn't understand me when I first met you. I remember she'd go. But, <laughs> but you know, for uh, you know, we were... Uh, we were taught in Moscow, we were taught British English. BBC English, yeah. Received yes. pronunciation. Yes. Yeah, you were. yes. The Queen's and now the King's English. Yeah. But you know, I remember when I was, uh, you know, we when were, the, we were getting distracted from Putin, aren't we? No. <laughs> <laughs> when I, uh, when, you know, miners were on strike. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher. Sorry, can you yeah, go to the mic? Ah, okay. During the Margaret Thatcher uh, mm, tenure, and they were dying one by one. And it was, of course, it was played up and out in the uh, Soviet Union's media. And all of us, we were watching this closely. It became, you know, they became in a way our, you know, part of our families. This I remember very strongly, even though, you know, I was anti-Soviet my entire life. But, you know, this was, I, could, I couldn't believe that the United Kingdom, and uh, of course, we read Dickens and Goldsworth and, you know, and Brian. You know, I mean, you name it, you know, we had a special course on English literature at school and history of Great Britain, everything Great Britain. And that was impossible sort of to come 
to turn to that and to realize that something so barbaric was going on in, in the oldest democracy in the world. Well, it is, of course, where Karl Marx wrote about the dark satanic mills. So, <laughs> you know, I guess <laughs> you know, there was something there. <laughs> Okay, you know, as I said, you know, I really strongly advise you to read this book because it is extremely interesting to read from very different perspectives. You know, or, uh, Fiona also writes about her life at Harvard and, you know, like that. so it's in very interesting. And I do too. write about Russia and the United yes, States. Yes, and, and of course, you know, about Russia. Russia. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and of course. And about, the parallels, yeah. Yes. Um, but let's get back to uh, uh, the topic. And of course, you know, Putin, Putin, Putin. I should say that in this book, uh, if you want to also disclose, I believe it is in this book, or in, uh, that you know uh, Donald Trump, for whom she worked as a uh, as a national security advisor in charge of the Russian desk, and then she testified. Of course, you know her first famous testimony during the impeachment trial uh, to the Committee of the U.S. Congress. So it is famous, famous Fiona Hill appearance, amazing, absolutely amazing. Anyway, but you know. Uh, 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 Donald Trump called you Russia bitch, right? Actually, he himself didn't. Um, apparently, um, uh, his uh, Rantz uh, Priebus, the first uh, chief of staff, did. You know, it's kind of a badge of honor. Just and Ivanka Trump didn't budget. like your uh, sneakers. Well, I did make a mistake of going in and forgetting my shoes. I put some shoes on today. I had my bag. I left my sneakers in your office over there. But I, uh, my first day at the um, at the office, um, uh, my daughter had thrown up all night on me. Yeah, it's not a great start to you know yeah, one's first day at work. And I had uh, run off to the metro um, and left my shoes behind. And I did. I thought I was going to get orientated. You know, which is what you do on your first day, where you find out where the office and the bathrooms are and things like that. And unfortunately, I got called into the Oval Office because there'd been a terrorist attack on the metro, the underground in St. Petersburg. And I was supposed to go in with H.R. McMaster, who was then the National Security Advisor to brief the president. Now, I've just got to tell you that most of these people who are hired to work in the National Security Council have never actually met the president. I had never met Donald Trump. I had not been on his campaign. I had been asked as a professional working on Russia by other people who were then trying to staff out the government. Uh, to join. And McMaster, as you might recall, had also not met the president before and had uh, been the man on the kind of casting couch, you know, sitting there looking like a deer in the headlights when he was asked to be the national security advisor after uh, the previous one, General Flynn, had you know, gone very quickly. And there was a massive turnover of people all the time. And so suddenly I'm being asked to go in and I didn't even know there'd been a terrorist attack, just to be quite clear. My daughter had been throwing up and I'd gone on the metro. By the time I got there, I was like, what? What happened? So this is the, you know, the, 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 the nightmare you all have of that exam or that thing that you know you think that you know you keep dreaming about it, you're not prepared for that was that moment. And then I was also I looked down at my feet and thought, I haven't got my shoes, I've got sneakers on. I said, but I can't go in. And so somebody pulled me into you know room and I tried on their shoes, that didn't work. It's like Cinderella, and I was like, <laughs> my foot in the shoe didn't work. So and then McMaster looks down. I mean, he, this is a guy who's you know faced down death in tank battles and things. He's like, come in, just stick your feet under the desk or the chair, and you know, he'll never look at you anywhere, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> and I was just supposed to, you know, come up with a quick briefing, and all I basically said was. Well, Mr. President, this will be um, a, a really significant personal um, uh, blow for Putin. It's his hometown. There's never been a terrorist attack in the um, Leningrad, uh, uh, the St. Petersburg metro before. He said, good, and that was it. <laughs> then I was off. <laughs> and he made the phone call and he said that, and that was that. But as I was sort of thinking that, okay, that was that was okay. I survived this. A banker Trump came into the um, into the Oval Office wearing an amazing white dress and stiletto heels that were so high that I had a, you know, had a nosebleed and fallen over. And, um, and it was just an like, amazing spectacle. She sat down beside me, looked down, and then just looked at me as if, who on earth are you? <laughs> my, feet, my feet are big and I couldn't stuff them under the chair. You know? So I was like, okay, busted. So that was, it, it never went up from there. So that was really kind of just, you know, telling all of you to be prepared. Ladies, remember your shoes. Men the same, you know, honestly. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, never, I never recovered from really that moment onwards. So, you know, Donald Trump was not really somebody who wanted to be advised in any case. 
but you know, I did find ways to work with all of my other colleagues. But that kind of really sneaker gate, I guess, you know, put a mark on what what really happened next. There were some really farcical elements uh, to that um, whole occasion. But anyway, but we do want to be advised. Vladimir Putin was not was anything but farcical, of course, oh, right. and it was deadly serious trying to deal with Putin. You know, against this backdrop of strange tragic comedy that was going on in our politics at the time. Uh, I have tons of questions, of course, you know, about, you know, Donald Trump and the way, you know, Russians really did help or didn't help him to become the president and his relation with Putin and his fascination with Putin, even after, you know, what happened with Elon Musk, you know, I understand a little bit better why he was so fascinated with Putin. But I have to ask you a question about, you know, what's happening right now as we speak. Because today Putin had a public meeting with his kangaroo council on human rights of his, you know, something that they call it a council on human relations or to human rights, you know. Uh, of course, you know, several weeks ago, he kicked out out of this council, whoever was capable to ask him any real right. questions. Right. However, you know, today he once again, he spoke about the threat of nuclear war. And he said, uh, I will say it in Russian, then translate oh, for you. I don't have to translate, but you know, for the audience. Yeah. По поводу угрозы, путинского, российская военная доктрина предполагает только ответ на встречный удар. Он пояснил, что Россия не применит, не применит ядерное оружие ни первый, ни второй. Но угроза ядерной войны растает, чего греха таить. Путин said that, you know, that uh, Russia is not going to use nuclear weapons, not if, as, a, as a first strike, not as the responsive strike, yet the danger of the nuclear war is getting bigger. So what do you read into this? Well, look, I read from that that Putin's actually worried that we've all, you know, kind of lost our sense of fear about this. So I've, um, you know, said from really early on that if Putin could use a nuclear weapon, he would because he want, he want to have a desired effect. He also knows that even talking about it is likely to strike terror into, um, you know, in, into everybody's minds here. It's a psychological game. I mean, it's basically a psychological operation because Putin knows only too well you know, the reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We've just had the 60th anniversary of this. He's always trying to kind of raise the idea of a return to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Russian propaganda has been very effective in that regard. We've had all kinds of of uh, comparisons made between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the current uh, state. We've never been closer to you know, nuclear um, exchange than now. Well, that is actually isn't true. Now, one of the reasons that I started studying Russian back in the 1980s, because you, know, you and I and actually other people here will remember, we had a war scare in uh, 1983, when the Soviet Union uh, was watching US exercises, Operation Able Archer, which uh, under the United States, many of you have probably read and written about this, probably somebody's dissertation topic out here. I know that Josh, I mean, this is kind of the areas and things that you, you know, you're very familiar with. When the whole idea was to, um, you know, set deterrence for the Soviet Union so that the Soviet Union, you know, would think twice and, and three times and more times about, you know, potential nuclear use because the United States was showing, you know, kind of off its, all of its strength and its determination, you know, to you know, potentially use nuclear weapons as well. Well, they over fulfilled the plan for Operation Able Archer. In fact, the Soviet Union actually thought that there was a first strike uh, being prepared by the United States. And, you know, I, as a younger person, and you know, you're probably on the other side of, you know, the Iron Curtain at that time, it was palpable, that kind of feeling of tension that we might be on the verge of a nuclear exchange because the United States and the Soviet Union had just started to place new categories of nuclear weapons uh, in Europe. Just like the Cuban Missile Crisis was about the stationing of weapons in Turkey and then uh, Khrushchev and uh, the Soviet leadership putting weapons in Cuba um, as, as a sort of recipro reciprocity, sort of tit for tat stationing. The same thing was happening in the 1980s. In fact, from the 1970s, 1977 to 1987, is a period of what we call the Euro missile crisis, where SS-20 and Pershing missiles, Soviet and US missiles were being stationed in uh, Europe. And these were intermediate nuclear missiles. So they weren't the strategic um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. It wasn't the Soviet Union and the United States that were going to be blowing each other up. But for you know Europeans, it was like, oh my God, we're suddenly ground zero. And this war that um, uh, the United States and uh, the Soviet Union might embark on would happen in Europe. And the United Kingdom, we thought, was going to be ground zero at the time. That's why my great uncle said to me, go and figure out why the Soviets are trying to bloody well blow us up. You know, what <laughs> happened here? Because this is against that uh, backdrop. And we had all of the um, 
public service announcements about you know what would happen in a missile strike you know we were practicing throwing ourselves in ditches when we were outside hiding in cupboards under the stairs you know kind of until you know all the all clear was gone it was just exactly the kind of duck and cover you know training that people had at a certain period in the 60s and 70s here in the united states well that um you know kind of period has obviously passed because in 1987 uh, after Gorbachev and Reagan are having all of their arms control negotiations, we sign the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, which tumps all of this down. Now, I want to use that as a link to just to illustrate why Putin's doing what he's doing. Because in 2019, when I was still in the National Security Council, the United States decides to pull out of the INF Treaty. So there's an irony of life there. You know, my whole childhood and teenage years and early years at university was shaped by the Euro missile crisis. God, I was relieved like everyone else when Gorbachev and Reagan signed the INF Treaty. But then, you know, we fast forward to 2019, decades later, and the Russians have been violating the treaty. And the only you know, country that's abiding by the treaty now is the United States. And the United States, you know, basically makes a decision that's been underway for some time that, look, this isn't working. We should pull out and start to negotiate new treaties. So the idea was to negotiate a larger omnibus arms control treaty. We also have the New START treaty that would need, you know, negotiating um, after. Um, I hope those alarms are not, you know, nuclear sirens here. So, mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, after 2010, that was going to need to be uh, renewed. And there was a meeting between Trump and Putin at the G20 in um, Osaka in Japan uh, in uh, the, the, this you know, early part, June uh, you know, or so of 2019, so June or July. And Putin basically says to Trump, well, Donald, what's going to happen with arms control when you pull out of the INF? Because the INF, you know, we'd already announced that the withdrawal was going to be in August and you know, we were just working this all the way through. And it did make the Europeans, particularly the Germans, nervous about this as well. And he said, this will be a world, you know, essentially without rules and without treaties. And, you know, your European allies remember the Euro missile crisis and kind of looked like this. And they said, and you, of course, and others remember the Cuban, or he called it the Caribbean crisis, which of course threw Trump off for a bit, because that's what the you know, Soviet Union and, the, and Russia called it, the Caribbean crisis. And I'm going to go into Caribbean crisis. Oh, yes, the Cuban missile crisis. <laughs> but it, it was already threatening, you know, basically the return to that atmosphere as a way of pressing the issue of arms control on Russia's terms. So this proceeds, this is 2019, everything that we're talking about now. Putin knows the psychological value of scaring everybody with the threat of some kind of use of nuclear weapons because he's a young guy in the KGB during the war scare. You know, he's been all the way through the Euro missile crisis in Dresden in Germany on the front lines of everything. And a lot of it was, you know, the, the psychological operations that he himself was probably scared like everybody else in the Soviet period in 1983 that there might be an exchange with the main opponent, the United States. And so, you know, what he's trying to do here now is manipulate those old fears. It's the sum of all of those fears. And recently, the Chinese and others have been putting pressure on Russia to back off on all of this nuclear saber rattling, because you can be sure that China as a rising you know, nuclear power, not just with tactical, but um, intermediate and strategic uh, missiles, does not want the whole apple cart um, overturned. And Putin and Russia are behaving like Kim Jong-un and North Korea, like rogue states blackmailing everyone with nuclear weapons, the whole strategic balance is off. There is no change in the nuclear balance, apart from the fact that Russia has developed hypersonic missiles, which the United States you know, hasn't you know, you know, got to fruition and hasn't announced. So it's Russia that has changed you know, in its, its nuclear arsenal, but it's Russia that is also saber rattling because it's losing a war in Ukraine. So this is not the Cuban missile crisis. This is not the Euro missile crisis. And Putin is now worried because he's been pressured by China and others to back off on the saber rattling that we'll have forgotten that the nuclear threat could be there because every time you put you know the idea of nuclear war nuclear armageddon world war three on the table everyone freaks out and the whole purpose is that, that you know if you don't give everyone the sense particularly here in the in the united states and the west that the war in ukraine could lead to nuclear war and could lead to world war three then it's less likely that people will back off on their support for ukraine so he's trying to find every which way you know, would it be interesting to see whether that gets picked up in China or elsewhere to kind of still keep the sense of a nuclear threat there? Because, you know, when he's talking about a nuclear exchange, the United States isn't planning on any kind of nuclear exchange. It's only Putin is talking about letting off a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. And if he could, he would, if he thought that it would get, you know, kind of everyone to basically push Ukraine to surrender. But at this point, he's realized it would actually get a backlash 
from countries like China and others that he um, and in the United Nations and you know he's, he's getting a lot of backlash against this so he's still trying to play a psychological operation so you know, he's already scared Finland and Sweden, you know, to who want to join in uh, NATO now and who didn't before because they worried about the nuclear saber rattling. He's got, you know, people worried, but he's getting not the effect that he wants. So he's still trying to get us, get us scared and worried about it. But you know how to read him. Do you really think that the guy who spent 22 years with all his entire entourage, you know, sucking out the Russian budget and Russian wealth is going to blow up everything with a nuclear bomb? No, I never thought he would blow up everything, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he had you know, found a way to use a tactical battlefield nuclear weapon somewhere near Kherson or Zaporizhia or you know, over you know, kind of an airburst in Black Sea or you know, something to give us all, you know, put people like Josh on alert and you know, writing things and you, know, you and others commenting on it. He wanted to do something for demonstration effect. Remember, he also said, and you know, this obviously you know, the, uh, the, the parallel isn't, you know, comp it's, it's not really a parallel, but he's making the point that the United States set the precedent with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Right, in, in 1945. In to stop a war. Well, you know, World War II, I mean, we all know that, you know, the background to this very different situation. He is losing a war that he started, you know, in invading a neighboring country. And what, what he wants to do, so he, he's destroying Ukraine in any case, using, you know, drones and... Uh, using all kinds of, you know, he's using ballistic missiles, but without nuclear warheads on it. But if you could really scare the heck out of everybody to stop the war with uh, the use of some battlefield nuclear weapons, he would, he would do it. But right now he's getting the messaging coming through from uh, all the international diplomacy that this wouldn't be acceptable. He was trying to kind of say, well, what about the United States doing this? And of course, you know, we had spent the whole time since 1945, basically saying, you know, we should never have done that. We should never use nuclear weapons. The use of nuclear weapons and nuclear war is impermissible. And he himself signed on to an agreement with that, reiterating what Gorbachev and Reagan said back in the 1980s with Biden in 2021. And again, you know, he's sort of saying, you know, Russia will never use, Lavrov is mm -hmm. saying that foreign minister. But he's just trying to figure out how we can have his nuclear cake and eat it and basically get everyone sufficiently scared. But as you said, and I think you're also the person who said, you know, the guy who's sitting at an incredibly long table, you know, he's here and his staff are, you know, over there out in the street and several blocks away, doesn't look like the kind of guy who wants to, you know, kind of sit in the middle of nuclear Armageddon if he's, you know, scared of being so close to his associates of cutting COVID or perhaps an assassination attempt. He's not likely to be trying to cause nuclear annihilation so we have to you know kind of think about how is he thinking about that it's all about a psychological operation and how to be effective but we also know he's used polonium he's used novichok or has allowed all of these to be used you know there was always assassinations back in the day so again if he could use something in a calculated risk he would so we have to make sure that he can't that there are constraints there and that you know we push back Yes, recently some dissident intelligence officers, Russian intelligence officers, published sort of a report claiming that, in fact, you know, two thirds of Russian nuclear arsenal is just a nuclear waste. That you know, you know, there were a lot of talks about you know Russia having you know the uh, second army in the world, and now we see that you know probably you know lots of what invested you know these trillions of dollars that were invested in the military reform were you know, ended up in the. Uh, in the different um, uh, lovely islands in the Caribbean. So, in the, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, what do you know about, what do you think about these reports? Well, look, I, I mean, I haven't actually seen this report, but every um, arsenal, be it nuclear or conventional, needs to be maintained. And, you know, we've had a lot of debates in the United States about, you know, modernization and maintenance because, you know, things degrade over time. And if, you know, I mean, we're not all in Colorado, but, you know, if you think about the Minutemen silos out in Colorado, I've got colleagues who've gone out and visited them. They've been there for decades. And, you know, of course, there is, you know, deterioration over time. I don't think mice are in there, you know, kind of nibbling on the wires or anything, you know, which kind of might be happening around here, around us, you know, right now. But, you know, everything needs maintaining. And yeah, I understand this, but do you think that he does have ability to use uh, nuclear weapons. Oh, yes, I'm sure he does. You so sure? the question is, you know, what kind of quantities? But I think that this report and many colleagues, you know, who look at these things, I have a colleague, Pavel Bayev, who's at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, who's also been saying it's not that easy, in fact. 
you know so again he does a lot of talk about it but it's not maybe not that easy because there's you know they haven't been you know basically out there testing everything the whole command and control you know kind of systems uh you know actually have lots of different layers it's very different from strategic uh right. nuclear weapons that the, the tactical battlefield rely on other people actually you know knowing how to use them and to but you know if if there was a will there would be a way and we, we've heard reports and they've been in the press that and have been you know announced in different ways that you know russian generals have been sitting around talking about them but look every military talks about contingencies and training and various plans doesn't mean to say they're actually going to do it but putin is the kind of man an operative that if he could do something that he would i mean why on earth you know basically poison alexander Litvinenko with polonium you know knocked him down a flight of stairs lots of people falling out of windows all the time in russia so yeah we've got you here and you know not there uh, and you know and novichok for god's sake you know it's because it was it was the spect spectacular shock and awe approach to things and scaring people and things you know you can have cruel and unusual punishments the shooting down of the MH17 from yes. the Malaysian Airlines. I mean, Putin himself doesn't have a you know great deal of restraints unless he thinks he's not going to get something out of it. And Polonium and Novichok were all meant to scare the heck out of everyone as well. The idea that you know Josh is holding a doorknob over there, that every door handle could be smeared with something. I know it's pretty handy pocket now. Could be smeared with something horrific because that's because that's that's the point, right? I mean, the point is to get everybody thinking, God, oh, that could be me. And so, you know, when I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, thinking about studying Russian, I thought, God, that could be me. I could be blown up by a nuclear weapon. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I went out to study Russian. You can <laughs> make some, please go out and study Russian, and, you know, kind of world affairs and, you know, start to do something about it. But it's that whole idea. It's, it's terrorism. It's, you know, state-sponsored terrorism to terrorize people because you, why? I mean, you, you've worked all about, Eugenia wrote all these books about the KGB and the way that they um, influence the system. The whole point is to psychologically defeat your adversary so that all of us think, well, we have no hope. Um, there can be no, you know, kind of way that we survive all of this. We just got to give up and capitulate, give in, because these guys will get us one way or another. And they're ruthless and they'll never stop. So that's, you know, kind of part of the, the whole thing here. But I think we can also see, you haven't asked that question, but I'm going to just add to this, that he can be constrained. Because, you know, you, he was talking about this very openly and really the whole tempo of this went up. And then, you know, you hear from, uh, from President Xi and the Chinese, you know, well, you know, we don't think that a nuclear war should be fought. Putin actually is saying to President Xi in a recent meeting, I understand you have concerns about the war. Uh, the um, Chinese foreign ministry making comments about this. Uh, the Indians, Prime uh, Minister, yeah. the Prime Minister Modi, mm -hmm. saying this is a time for peace, not a time for war. Other countries, you know, expressing their shock and horror at the idea that this is getting contemplated in such a way. So we also see on food security, because P Putin's trying to weaponize uh, food, grain, uh, fertilizer, not just oil and gas. But when um, uh, just very recently the Russian government talked about pulling out of the grain deal that was created by the United Nations and Turkey, but then they backtracked in a couple of days because other countries that are reliant on this. Erdogan was very angry. Oh, he was losing well, money. Yes, I mean, yeah. Turkey and the, the United Nations wasn't. You know, th those are important assets for Russia as well. Putin wants to play the United Nations if he can. He wants to play Turkey as the other kind of big power in the, in the Black Sea. But he wants what... to keep them on, you know, kind of. Because the UN is the arena, you know, for, for Russia. They, they've been very effective in the United Nations in the past. So if you end up in a, a place where many of most of the members of the General Assembly are opposed to you, particularly, you know, the kind of countries of the, you know, what we used to call the third world, now we call it the global south, but the countries that are very dependent on um, food imports and grain imports and fertilizer imports, and now they know it's you and they can't blame it on sanctions from the West, you know, you've got a bit of a problem there. So it, it is possible to influence and constrain him in some ways. What is his end game? He's destroying Ukraine, we see, you know, people are living in the cities without heat and uh, water and electricity, and uh, he's bombing the cities and destroying, uh, turning Ukraine into pieces. What is his end game? What does he want? He knows that he's not going to win this war. I think he knows. Yeah, I think that's exactly what his end game has become now, because what he wanted to do when he first launched this special military operation is basically, uh, it's not achievable anymore, which was, you know, the 
capitulation of Ukraine intact. I mean, he was intending to dismember parts of territory and absorb it directly into the Russian Federation. That was obvious. But he didn't want to completely destroy the country. What he wanted to do was turn it into what we've got with Belarus, which is a country that's dependent and, uh, oops, mm -hmm. under the influence of, sorry, no problem. Water there, no problem. And no under problem. the, um, you know, the direct influence um, uh, of, uh, uh, of Russia. And, you know, I think there's, I think all of us are by now are very familiar with the fact that he made this decision around the backs of his, uh, most of his security team, most of the, uh, I mean, you, you've written about this as well, were somewhat shocked and surprised by what happened. He anticipated it would be over within about a week to maybe two weeks at the most. It would be like, you know, the at the worst, what happened when the Soviet Union intervened in Czechoslovakia and in Hungary and you know, Poland back in the day, but you'd bring everybody back into the fold again. And then, you know, he would be basically presiding over a, a basically a subjugated Ukraine. Well, a, a, the exact opposite of this has happened. You've had the, you know, Ukrainians fighting back and, and then some. And so at this point, it's punishment, you know, with, with Ukraine. It's, you know, if I can't take over an intact Ukraine, I'm going to destroy it. And, you know, he's uh, September 30th, obviously, put him in a position where there's really not a lot of turning back from by annexing uh, not just Donetsk and Lukansk, which he'd already recognised as being independent, but also Zaporizhzhia and Kherson and putting all these placards, Russia is here forever, the return of, uh, you know, parts of the Russian land, the Russian world, um, you know, and, and the fact that he does this was such public um, acclaim, but not just the great big huge ceremony in the Kremlin, but then on Red Square with this whole, you know, enormous uh, spectacle of celebration, all very highly staged. It's very hard to go back on that without a massive loss of face. So really what he's doing now um, as a result of, you know, that humiliation is, is punishing, is, is destroying. Now that comes, you know, is, is ripped out of the pages of history. I mean, how many times do we all know from ancient early modern, you know, medieval <coughs> modern history that, you know, marauding armies when they can't get their objectives just destroy the place. You know, the sack of this, the sack of that, you know, I, I mean, I've spent many time reading history books and, you know, looking at how armies just laid places to waste. Um, you know, it's not just something that's exclusive to Russia. You know, we've seen, you know, plenty of this in the past. But, Except you know, that it was 21st it. century. But it, I, that's what I was going to say. But the problem <laughs> is he's behaving like it's the 1780s, you know, all over again. In fact, that's kind of what he's saying. He's trying to turn the, the clock back again. But, you know, we're actually in the 2020s and we've got a lot of other problems on our hands. Today again, you know, he mentioned Peter the Great and basically all yeah. the time he keeps saying that he's doing what Peter the Great was doing back, uh, of course, in the 18th century. No. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, and all the rest of it. Yes. yes. Well, the world has moved on a bit, and that's yeah. kind of you know part of the problem. But what Putin has done, and this is why you know we have to pay so much attention to it, is he's put into question every European uh, border, not just in you know, the post-Soviet borders, but he's basically saying, you know, I, I want to do a rerun. I want to kind of you know redraw exactly. the map of Europe. Which is why the Poles are freaking out because you know if you start thinking you know back to the 1780s, you have the partition of Poland. You know, Catherine the Great partitioned Poland. You know, the so, third you know, partition of yeah, Poland. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. yeah, but you know, we've got that's right. The Poles have been partitioned many times. Yeah. The Finns are thinking, hang on a sec, we were exactly. part of the Russian Empire. Ah, oh, that's our being. And the Swedes, of course, were battling Peter the Great for the control of a lot of this territory. The Battle of Poltava, the famous battle that you know makes Russia the empires between. Charles the Twelfth and uh, uh, Peter, Peter, Peter the Great uh, in, uh, in of the Ukrainian territory, and of course, at that point, there was also battles later on the Ottoman Empire. This is again also oh, Baltic uh, nations have freaked out exactly. So he's he's not just put the post-Soviet borders under question, but also the European borders as well. Every European country has had border changes. Do you think or, or that he will go him. into this whole-scale European war? I would actually say we're already there, but let's just say what we mean by whole scale. So this is the third great power conflict in Europe in a century. And Putin himself has taken us back also to 1918 by basically saying Ukraine shouldn't have existed. It was created by Lenin and the Bolsheviks as a republic inside of the Soviet Union. Before that, there was no idea of Ukraine, which is true. But anyway, that's kind of you know, part of the image. So we're going back 100 years and trying to do a redo. He's, he's talked about, obviously, the denazification of Ukraine, so and, and, and raising the whole ideas of World War II as well. He's declared war on the West. I mean, Putin has basically said this is a great power European war, a, a replay of that. Now, what we're trying to uh, do, and well, I think he's trying to avoid it as well, is a direct conflict with the United States and NATO. I mean, we, we are actually seeing a lot of restraint here, not just on our part, but also on his part. 
that's the kind of the World War Three that everyone's talking about. But at the same time, we've got the same structures as World War One in particular, but also elements of World War Two, with Putin behaving like Hitler and you know they're thinking about the annexation um, of the Sudetenland, the Anschluss with um, with Austria because they spoke German. You know, even though the Austrians and obviously have a very different um, historical uh, tradition as well as a different history from um, other parts of Germany, and Germany itself isn't, you know, unified until you know the 1870s. So I mean, Putin is basically, I mean, again, following patterns that we've had in these other two, you know, what we call world wars, but really European wars. And but the rest of the world is having knock-on effects. Now, World War II, of course, became global because of the war in the um, in Asia and the Pacific, and you know, Japan and Pearl Harbor bringing in you know, you know, the United States. And, you know, this hasn't, you know, they, they, we haven't gone on that path, but we are having knock-on effects with global trade, oil and gas, food security. You know, countries like Japan and South Korea have been extraordinarily alarmed by what's happening, the precedent that what's happening could set, not just for Taiwan, obviously, which, you know, we haven't recognized as, you know, a completely independent state, which we did with Ukraine for 30 years and all the other former Soviet republics. But what does this set then for other regional territorial conflicts? Remember, India has a, a major conflict with um, not just with Pakistan over Kashmir, but also with China in the Himalayas. And India was looking to Russia to help them, you know, offset China. That's not going to happen. And India and China clashed not so long ago in the Himalayas, and many people were killed in an, in an armed clash. Think about all the other conflicts globally that could, you know, be fueled further by this because we've got, you know, um, Saudi Arabia attacking Yemen. You know, it's, it's right. going on. We've got wars inside of Ethiopia. Yeah, this is all TK. very scary. It, it is very worrying because this can be an accelerant to all kinds of other conflicts. We saw in Nagorno Karabakh again. I mean, in Azerbaijan now in direct conflict, and no longer you know the kind of pro proxy conflicts that have been going on there as well. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan uh, having a, a border fight, and Russia's lost its ability to arbitrate there. And you know we're going back to the past with all these interactions in the Black Sea with Russia and Turkey, and you know um, the, the in, in the Middle East it's very interesting. I was talking to a colleague who um, specialised in the Middle East um, last week. And they were saying that a lot of Middle East countries now see this like the Iran-Iraq war. You know, but it went on for 10 years and changed the whole way that um, people interact with each other in the Middle East. I hadn't thought of that, honestly. I just thought I'd throw that out you know, from my colleague because I thought it was a very wise and very interesting observation. But saying that this is what the, you know, the Emirates and the Iranians themselves see this like. And so they see kind of uh, that they've got to orient around this. And, you know, of course, lots of Russian money is now going into um, Dubai and into the Emirates. Right. A lot of the oligarchs and others are kind of um, looking to there as a new kind of platform for operations. And, you know, we're seeing the Iranians providing Russia with drones. We're seeing the Saudis, you know, looking at ways in which they can orient their um, energy sector. We're seeing a lot of knock on effects in this. So this is a conflict with global reach, even if it might not be fully a global conflict. And I don't think Putin intended any of this when he you know, set out on February 24th to retake Kiev. Right, and given that he's running a kleptocracy, I cannot imagine that all these people, listen, you know, I just yesterday I spoke to uh, some lawyers of the firm which are working on behalf of one of the Russian super rich, super, super, super rich. And then, and, you know, they were asking me, you know, whether, you know, these sanctions against the individuals and such, or whether, you know, it's justifiable to impose the sanctions and to create, you know, difficulties. So, and what will be your response to them? Look, it's war. It's a wartime scenario. I just, you know, started off saying what happened to Great Britain during World War II. All of our oligarchs and business people disappeared. In other words, these um, you know industrialists in Britain, like the you know oligarchs here, many of them actually you know taken land <laughs> with William the Conqueror, <laughs> the Norman Conquest, eleventh century, and you know been um, you know invested in the emergence of uh, of industry and business, and they were all wiped out by World War II, and you know Britain was supposedly on the side of the victors. When you get into a wartime situation, you know the, there are knock on effects in economies. You know, we saw the devastation of uh, the German economy in World War One and World War Two. But do you think that sanctions are going to work? And I believe that Rory McFucker should be somewhere around on, on Zoom. Well, it, it depends on, I mean, it would be interesting to get, you know, kind of some of the other uh, people to come in on this, because it depends on what we mean by work, right? Is it going to change Putin's goals? Actually, probably not. But would it constrain his ability to achieve them? Well, yes, in some respects it will. But it, the question is then, what, what is then the reaction side of Russia itself? Do other people start to look at, you know, the 
very bleak prospects for Russia's future and decide that you know enough is enough and that maybe Vladimir Vladimirovich should be you know kind of moved off into you know kind of a different place and you know I'm not going to you know comment on you know what that might be but the, you know, the point is of course that he extended and his somebody terms asks of, me I say it's with his throat uh, I'm, not going to say I'm sorry you know you're yeah, not you're supposed right, to say right, that's right, right. <laughs> 2020 uh, you know, Putin decides to extend his time in office, so he gets the Russian Duma, the Russian Parliament, to uh, you know to engage uh, in, in this. You know, to give him another twelve years after twenty twenty four, because he hasn't kind of figured out the succession plan, or you know how he protects himself and his system. So the, the idea is, you know, give himself another twelve years up to twenty thirty six. You know, by which he'll be in his his eighties, far exceeding Stalin and you know many of the czars in place here. So the system has become completely, as we're all well aware, dependent on one guy who's the wild card in all of this. And he's not going to change the way that he thinks about this. Certainly not now. He's doubled and tripled down. He's in for the long haul. His whole legacy, his whole, everything that he's, you know, basically talked about and thought about recently is all riding on this. He's thrown out prosperity and all the pragmatism that we saw in the Russian economy. He didn't certainly consult with the central bank, Alvira Nabiulina, another extraordinary good and competent uh, financial experts. I mean, the central bank of Russia had a, you know, half its assets outside of Russia where they've been frozen. She clearly didn't know this was going to happen. You'd have taken the gold and you know got it cashed out of the foreign currency. You'd have done something to protect against this. They did factor in some sanctions, but as Putin thought this would be over really quickly, they weren't actually planning for the long haul. But Putin, I don't think, really cares about that now because what he cares about is basically getting the outcome. His end game is still destruction of Ukraine, absorbing. Um, uh, Ukrainian territory, getting recognized, uh, the annexation of Crimea and probably Donetsk and Lukansk as well, and maybe, you know, perhaps negotiating a little bit um, here and there on Zaporizhia and Kherson based on, you know, wherever we're going. In order to gain what? Uh, and then, you know, hopefully to push for the lifting of some of the sanctions, because this is, <laughs> to my point, they are hurting. And what they're hurting is the future of the Russian economy and Russia's development. You're here, right? I met with somebody last night who said that they're about to go and meet with one of the directors of the Bolshoi, you know, a young uh, man in his late 30s who's left, because suddenly every Malachinka. young guy in mm -hmm. um, uh, Russia wants to leave, because otherwise they're going to end up in the front, and they're going to end up, you know, where my granddad ended up in World War I, in a trench, you know, in somewhere like Bakhmut, you know, staring over the trench, uh, you know, somebody who might be their cousin. You know, in this case, because, you know, we, we know that um, 11 million or so, in, at least in the most recent census, uh, people in, in Russia identify themselves as Ukrainians and, you know, many more have, uh, have relatives there. This is an internecine warfare. Absolutely it is. And most people don't want to be there. Um, and, you know, just like in World War One, people didn't expect to be there for very long. That, you know, dragged on also for years and, you know, ended up in the mass destruction of, you know, most of, um, you know, the productive males of France and Britain and so on. Because my grandfather was only one of two people from his uh, class at school who returned from um, basically Flanders. And he fought through the entire war and it's because he didn't join the local military, the local infantry, the German light infantry were wiped out in several battles. He was with the big guns and he would have been out there with those, you know, could be huge. And a high Mars or a Takums or something <laughs> right now. Uh, but he was in the, he was in a different division and everybody else was wiped out. Entire villages and towns uh, were wiped out in the United Kingdom in World War One. And that's happening in Russia. That's happening in places like in Buryatia or out in you know kind of the sticks of Siberia and in Dagestan and elsewhere. Gordon Altai and, and actually Gordon mm -hmm. Altai and various other places. So this is devastating Russia as well. And hundreds of thousands, the, one of the statistics I heard recently, and, you know, of course, you've probably seen the same thing, a million Russians have left since February. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're one of a million, you know, have left. Because nobody wants to be part of this carnage of the people who have left. Or they, you know, they, they, they want to be part of the future of Russia, but not part of Putin's perverse past. And that is going to have devastating effects. And the sanctions, uh, I think, in some respects, are kind of the least of it. Because so many of the big companies, I'm sure many people here have had conversations as well, will not return now to Russia. With the, you know, the embargo on... You know, Certainly hundreds of companies well, but, left Russia. But a lot of the... Um, and they, they won't go back now because they'll have you know, moved on to elsewhere. The, the attraction of Russia was the size of the consumer market and also the commodities. And now that Europe is having to go cold turkey on Russian gas and oil, they're not going to go back if you know, this ends tomorrow. So Putin's already gone too far here. 
you know, the, the, the longer this war has gone on, the less it's been you know, in his favor. We're seeing already the cannibalization of all kinds of other equipment, you know, washing machines for the tanks, the commercial fleet for um, airplanes. I mean, yes, of course, Russia will be able to adapt just like Iran has with the, you know, the drones and all the rest of it, but it's going to take some time. And although they're still getting revenues from oil and gas uh, sales, they're going to have to reorient again the markets. That will, you know, um, there'll be opportunity costs there. And there's a question, what can they buy with the money? And I do think that, you know, Putin himself, because we've we've seen him having all of these meetings with his economics team telling that they need to adapt, he recognises that this isn't going to be easy when we get into next year. But again, you know, the question of sanctions is, yeah, they will have an effect, but do they work in terms of changing the goals? And again, again I think, you know, for Putin, it's really how do you constrain what he can actually do? Because his goals won't change. It's just how do you make it very difficult for him to pursue them? It turned out that the United States uh, uh, had an amazing intelligence on Putin's intentions uh, to invade Ukraine and uh, as early as October uh, 2021. Uh, United States warned uh, Mr. Kuleba, you know, the, the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, and uh, then President Zelensky himself uh, about the uh, upcoming war. In December of 2021, two months prior to invasion, Bill Burns, the current head of the CIA, went to Moscow and informed Russian counterparts that the US does know about the intentions. Still, it seems that the war came as a surprise. The US military analysts overestimated the power of the second army in the world, as they called the Russian army, and underestimated the ability of Ukrainians to resist. So my question to you, from your readings of Putin's and Kremlin, why did he decide to start the war knowing that US were going to support Ukraine? Well, because he figured it would be over so quickly that nobody would have the, you know, the time to react. Like Crimea. Yeah. I mean, Crimea was you know, well before anybody blinked. And, All right. And there was no, you know, kind of um, hardly, I mean, no shooting. Don Butts was much different, of course, because the, the same effort to do what was done in Crimea basically sparked off a war that went on for you know, eight years after that. And there was an effort also to try to create uprisings um, all the way down to the territory that has been you know, attacked by the Russian forces all the way down to Odessa. And you know, people might remember that some of those failed spectacularly, including this big fire in one of the offices and things that, yeah, in Odessa and um, you know, uh, these various sort of insurgents or militia and other you know, groups that were uh, uh, declaring allegiance uh, to Russia. And that all fizzled out. But he, he really did assume and you've written you know, about this and interviewed people about it, that you know, this would all move really quickly. So he didn't plan for basically a World War II-like campaign, which is what he's got himself in for. This is much more like Chechnya, uh, going back to the 1990s, 1994, when the same thing happened with Pavel Grachov. Um, he, he thought that, you know, he said to Yeltsin something like, I'll be in and out and you'll never know. I was three days. There. Three days. Three days. And mm -hmm. next thing, that was the largest military conflict on Russian soil since World War II. And now we've got the largest conflict in Europe since World War II. So it's, it's basically, it was a special, it really was supposed to be a special operation and not supposed to be a full on war. So that's exactly why he miscalculated and probably, you know, the reason why everybody else miscalculated as well, because we were looking at Russia fighting this kind of conflicts that we've, you know, seen them engage in. We were thought we were engaged in counterinsurgencies. You know, they've got the paramilitary organizations, Wagner and other kinds of groups that, you know, fly into Venezuela or Mali and elsewhere and Syria and, you know, prove to be, you know, relatively effective. We saw them fighting in Syria, but they're fighting an opposition that wasn't armed and wasn't trained as a military with the Syrian military. So, you know, and also, you know, we look at all these other conflicts. Russia hasn't been engaged in a conflict of that nature since Afghanistan, and that was the Soviet Union. That was a much bigger country with soldiers from Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, you know, for example. It wasn't a war with Russia. The only other, you know, major Russia war was Chechnya internally, and that was a debacle. And of course, Georgia, the whole thing uh, was over in um, 10 days in 2008. We always forget about that. That was also an old style conflict. And we assumed that they'd really modernize themselves, but modernize themselves for a different kind of warfare that we thought that we were you know, planning. Uh, but your military analysts well. were writing that, you know, that Ukrainians, 
they were unable, they would be able to sustain the war for more than, you know, several days. But that wasn't the case. Of, so the thing is, a lot of people have looked at the Russian military. We have a lot of experts on the Russian military and not so many experts on the Ukrainian military. But those people who had been working with the Ukrainian military on helping them, you know, restructure had a different view. They said the Ukrainians would fight. Now, I don't think they could have quite anticipated the extent to all of this. But of course, you know, then we have stepped in to help, um, you know, equip the Ukrainian military. But the other thing is, since 2014, the Ukrainians have been on alert and have been restructuring themselves because they've been at war with Russia since 2014. So they actually had a lot of prep time here. And cyber is another element here that uh, Ukraine has been the second most attacked country after the United States, going back again to 2014. And an awful lot of those Russian-speaking IT experts out there happen to be Ukrainian in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, as you know, right? And so there's been... I had a design of it. Uh, yeah, see? So every, um, you know, kind of Ukrainian cyber expert and IT expert, which we've a lot, have been, have been training, have been constantly focused on the threats of cyber attacks. And the Ukrainian um, uh, cyber uh, command equivalents have been working with the United States and other European allies for a very long time now. So they've been ahead of all of this. It's just all of us who forgot that Russia had invaded Ukraine in 2014. And that, you know, when they you know, did it again in uh, 2022, that this is, for, for, for many in Ukraine, this is a continuation. Uh, and look, I mean, another thing is, of course, you, know, you mentioned the intel and Bill Burns and others. There was a lot of disbelief about this including on the Ukrainian part, because they thought it wouldn't be rational to want a full-scale invasion. Because again, Putin wasn't prepared for a full-scale invasion. He was actually preparing for what he thought was a special military operation. He didn't intend to use all of the troops that he sent in. I mean, we were correct that he was planning on invading, but in his mind, he literally was doing a special military operation. It wasn't the full-on conflict. Okay, so if the US knew about the invasion, and you realized what he was going to do. Why didn't NATO supply Ukraine with HIMARS and other modern equipment much earlier than you know this? You know they supplied HIMARS uh, during the summer. Why do they? You still allow, as we speak, Russians to destroy Ukraine? Why you don't close skies? It's because of the way that the battlefield has um, evolved. I mean, again, nobody was planning for a, a huge long war. So I mean, this is you know where we are again. The battlefield evolves all the time and but you, you could know, give them high marks in January they you know to stop this to stop Putin to stop Putin at the borders one of, one of the problems that we all have is you know because I was in the government there's sort of an assumption that we have all kinds of stuff sitting around everywhere we actually don't I mean we are half production but you know we have our own long-term plans and you know we you know produce according to the plans we were not planning no one was planning for a major, you know, basically conflict of this kind of scale in Europe. So it's actually not that simple to just, you know, suddenly give the Ukrainians all kind of equipment. Now we know that the Baltic states and Poland have pretty much turned over everything that they've got. But the United States is a global power, and we're worried about things happening in, in, in other places. So one of the issues here is about how the United States and how, you know, other European countries uh, are working together to figure out, you know, about how to keep Ukraine supplied over the longer term. Now, I'm not, you know, a military uh, expert. I mean, there's a lot of really great people out there. You can go and read lots of things on War on the Rocks and, you know, all kinds of other, you know, places where, you know, people who know a lot about this talk about this. But it's not that simple to basically, uh, you know, I remember when I was in government trying to find, you know, a Patriot battery, for example, from one of our allies, and it was kind of remarkably difficult. It's not like they're in a closet somewhere. There was one on the top of the White House, but I don't think we were going to give that away. You know, so there's actually a lot of these things are not in production because they have to be ramped up. So getting back to, you know, where I start about World War II, think about what happened in the United States during World War II. We, we turned all of our car factories into factories making tanks, and then we turned them back in peacetime back to car factories again. You ramp up production during a war. Russia itself wasn't prepared for this. Russia is having problems now as well. They've gone through you know, they're fixed wing, you know, kind of at a rapid scale. They're going through their tanks and their RPGs and they're going through all of their ammunition and equipment too. They did not plan for this. And so, you know, it's not like, again, we have lots of stuff sitting around there that isn't already spoken for. As you well aware, Putin doesn't see presidents, prime ministers, chancellors in democracies as equals. No. They come and go and he himself and the chairman see they stay. 
does he see the U.S. super rich as sort of equals? Elon Musk is one of them. On the one hand, Elon Musk, Skyling, did a great service to Ukrainians by providing reliable internet access. Just, you know, a week ago, I did an interview with somebody in Kiev, and in Viv, and we were unable to talk because, you know, internet went down, 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 because, of course, you know, Russians destroyed uh, the internet. And he was talking about, yes, and he was talking about, you know, uh, installing Skylink in his apartment, but we know that Skylink exists on the front lines and, you know, uh, Ukrainian commanders have access, this way they have access to internet and to satellites and to see, you know, the movement of Russian troops, et cetera, et cetera. So on the one hand, he did this great job. On the other hand, he's one of the proponents of the ideal land for peace. You spoke about this in the interview that we, of course, you know, published on the New Times website. Can you visualize for us a kind of conversation Musk and Putin had or have been having? What kind of arguments Putin uh, uses with this type of guys? Well, look, I'm, first of all, I'm not sure whether Putin actually meets with all these people directly. Yes, you but said that there are intermediaries. Yeah, there might be intermediaries, which are the other business people. And it's because of the, you know, the interreactions, you know, uh, or, or relationships and interactions over a very long period of time between the super rich in Russia and the super rich everywhere else around the world. A lot of these interactions, you know, might happen now in Dubai, you know, before they might have happened in London. Or here in you know New York, you know for example, and uh, you know it's basically a seeding of the ideas that are out there. Where did you know, Mars perhaps... get the idea for this idea? Your land for peace. Well, look, Putin's been making that kind of uh, very clear for you know a long kind of period of time. So I would imagine that every Russian oligarch and rich you know business person who's interacted with them has heard this. You know, uh, Elon Musk himself is the world's richest man. Of course, Putin would try to find different ways of getting to him as with intermediaries. It's also, you know, people like uh, Henry Kissinger, um, you know, Kissinger Associates, and people have been going backwards and forwards to Russia. 13 Henry, times. Yeah, Henry Kissinger himself has- Was you know, 13 times. These kinds of, uh, yeah. and, and Henry Kissinger and Elon Musk and others have, um, you know, links. It's a very tight circle when you get up into these rarefied uh, relationships. I mean, I've been to conferences while these people are there. They've obviously all know each other. They meet all the time. They're always talking. This is kind of circulating. And it was just, you know, very striking, of course, that, you know, Musk said, well, Putin would accept this because Putin has made it clear. I think all of us understand what Putin, uh, at least, you know, would like to have at, the, at this precise moment. The thing is, of course, Putin is trying to say, or trying to see, rather, how far people are willing to go to accommodate him. So, you know, Elon Musk had put out that idea that's kind of like the opening gambit, you know, which is, you know, yes, I'd like Crimea recognized, Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, maybe there might be some... You know, kind of, this is all before Zaporizhia and Kherson are also um, annexed, uh, remembering this is before September 30th. Uh, and, you know, maybe there might be some international supervision, which sounds like Minsk 3, perhaps after Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 for Donbass. And then there's the guarantee of water, very specific, you know, from Ukraine to Crimea. That was very specific. That's because Crimea is a dry peninsula, so just for yeah, so don't know. It just has, mm-hmm. no, it has no rivers, it just has a canal that comes from Kherson, from the Dnieper. And, um, you know, basically, you know, we guarantee a kind of like dancing corridor going back in the day of, uh, of uh, infrastructure, you know, connecting um, Crimea with everything that Russia's been trying to get hold of. So it's very clear that Kherson and Zaporizhia would come into play there. Very specific. You know, so basically, that's the opening gambit. So what Putin's trying to do is see how do people react? And how better than have someone like Elon Musk or like Kissinger or the Pope, the Pope's been in on the act as well, you know, basically saying that this is kind of what Putin wants. Well, yeah, we know what Putin wants. Very clear. So he's trying to figure out, will we give it to him? And then if we will, will you? can we take something else? Well, no, we won't. Because, again, think what the precedent of that will be. So ironically, of course... Putin could probably have gotten some kind of recognition of Crimea if he hadn't invaded, because there were already talks going on and the Ukrainians themselves were saying they would be willing to put it on ice, as it were, for 15 years. And then, you know, to see that's the... As late as the, April 2022. Yeah, this is what happened with yeah. the Saarland, mm-hmm. you know, for example. Um, it's been fought over, you know, so many times in Germany. We've, we've done this many times. You can put things under, we have the League of Nations, United Nations receivership. There's all kinds of different formulations. And as you said, I mean, the, up until April of uh, 2022, the Ukrainians were willing, you know, to contemplate that. And Putin's now trying to bring us all back to that, to say that there was a peace deal that was on the table, that, you know, we could have had, so why not go back to that after all this carnage, you know, to kind of accept all of this? But I mean, basically, 
that was there was many different factors that undermined that but you know one of them was I really wanted more it was like you know I'll take what I can get and then see what else I can get later on in one of the interviews, you said that while you were in the National Security Council, you saw Putin sending intermediaries to you and to other policymaking people in the White House. Who were those people in the military? Who were they? Well, there's all kinds of people. I mean, this is the kind of classic. You probably, everybody here who studies Russian and NYU probably gets, you know, somebody sidling up, you know, at different points as well. There'd be people who were in business circles. But to you, for people, instance, who were? People who, you know, kind of, um, you know, have connections with, uh, well, look, in the United States, there are lobbyists, right? So uh, people can fill out in a foreign agent registration act of FARA uh, from law firms and uh, from um, all kinds of PR firms, and they can represent Russian interests and they can request a meeting. And of course, that means the embassy and official channels. But, you know, often, you know, we would find that, you know, the Russians would approach someone and they, they would, you know, want to come in and talk. Yes, we remember that Donald Trump was approached by the boyfriend of uh, one of, you know, this honey trap, Butchina. There are all kinds of people who can be, that was kind of the big risk in the previous administration was that the doors were open to absolutely anybody and everybody. I mean, usually in governments, you know, particularly if you know someone is a lobbyist, you know, you're kind of aware that they're coming in here to, to represent. I would say that, you know, since the war, a lot of those groups that did represent Russian interests or Gazprom's interests or Rosneft or anything, they've pulled back because, you know, it's obviously not the same as it, as it was before. But then, I mean, the people that you and I and others know were on the boards of many of these companies and they would, you know, try to come to, public meetings or embassy events and others and kind of come up and try to, you know, basically pass on, you know, messages, Henry Kissinger, you know, the, the Russians, Putin meeting. But he's him. nine to nine now. Yeah, but he's still, he's Henry Kissinger. And so, you know, for Putin and others, there, there is a value. Elon Musk is obviously younger and probably likely to go on for a lot longer. And he's the richest man on the planet. And he has, now he has Twitter and a massive following. So a very useful person to transmit these messages. Okay, so and uh, now, but you know, you just put me in this. Do, are we supposed to do yes, all yes, 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 yes. But you know, what? I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, there are two last questions that I have to ask you because it's important just to spell them out. This is the uh, letter that I just got from Alexei Navalny from jail. It went through the official uh, line censorship. Does he actually separate. write them himself? Yes, it's all him. So it's actually, it's his, it's actually uh, yes, of well. course. Of course, but before, you know, anyway, it doesn't matter. But, you know, now we have to go for all these, you know, sonship channels. And he wants to gain, you know, in the solitary confinement. Yeah. So, by the way, here he is asking me, you know, I read him, the, wrote him the uh, review of the outcomes of the elections. And he was surprised. And he's asking me what happened to AOC. And, you know, why do I think that Santos is capable to compete with Trump? Anyway, so there are, yes, 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 you know, he's very, and he's extremely into, I'm going to write, but you know, he's in the solitary confinement. Yeah. He has nine years in jail. This is the letter that didn't come from the official channels from Ilya Yash. Yeah. On two days from now, yeah. on December 9th, he'll be sentenced to nine years in jail. Yeah, we also have in the Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. who is expecting trial. And nine is the least. We also have our um, and you basketball have to... star, uh, Brittany Griner, nine years in jail. Right. Paul Whelan, uh, former Marine. Uh, he's been given, I think, even more than that. Can we do this? In the past, in the Soviet times, there were, we know, Bukowski was exchanged, uh, Bukowski was exchanged, Sharansky was exchanged, Ginsburg was exchanged. Is it possible? These are, well, I can tell you honestly, if you want, these are my closest hands. I know. Yeah. And my heart is bleeding that I'm in the United States and the luxury of this university and this city. And Ayosh is writing to me, you know, what's better in Pakate, it's jail inside jail, jail, that at least I can drink some coffee. He's not allowed to see, he, they canceled all his family reunions. In your, I went to Green Haven, your maximum security prison, murderers there. They have their family reunions every two months. They have visitors' rights each each day, six days a week. They can see their wives. He he <clears throat> he's no longer alive. He's forty five. His wife is beautiful, forty five year old, and everything. You know, they're just killing him. After they, as you know, they uh, tried to kill him with uh, yeah. Novich. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any ways yeah. to get them out? Well, look, I think all of us here. All of us have the ability to you know keep this in mind and to, you know constantly keep this in 
the focus of attention as you're doing now, you know, congressmen, you know, kind of any, anybody you know, that we can, Amnesty International, I mean, you name it, the United Nations, uh, anywhere that we can keep this in the public spotlight. So it's not just an issue of the United States and Russia. Should I try to approach Elon Musk? Maybe, you know, he's more capable I, 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 of doing I this? I wouldn't, uh, because that would you know, make things even more complicated. But I do think that it's, you know, something, you know, look, we have around the world right now political prisoners in many other countries, Iran, Turkey, and other places that are doing this. I mean, the reason that um, uh, Alexei Navalny and... Uh, Vladimir Karamoza and Ivy Ashin are in because Putin thinks they're dangerous. They're dangerous to him. Um, he's found all of them. This is because he's running scared, because they actually can whip up opposition. Why was Navalny poisoned with Novichok? Because he was out in the Urals and in Siberia at the time, bringing opposition groups together. Mass mobilization, yeah. they're afraid of that. Yeah, yeah, because they know that there's so much dissatisfaction, especially right now, with, you know, they're, they're thrilled that people leave, but of course, Navalny went back. And he's incredibly brave. He's probably the bravest person out there. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and, he could go. Yeah, all, he, of these, he, all of them could yeah. have left and they'd come back. And that, to Putin, I mean, these guys are not that brave themselves. I mean, they hide behind, you know, Praetorian guards and Kremlin walls and, you know, huge kind of bodyguards, but they're frightened of losing their power. And they're frightened of, you know, a, a, a defeat in Ukraine and what that might mean, because Putin knows his, his history. You know, people say, where is the Lenin? And of course, Putin hates Lenin. And 2024 is going to be the 100th anniversary of Vladimir Lenin's death. And in the middle of the, the, the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin is brought back on the SEAL train by the German High Command, who didn't you know, quite know how this would all play out. And, and Alexei Navalny comes back on was it Lufthansa, not quite the SEAL train. No, he, he didn't come on Lufthansa on, on Russian Pabeda. He was very careful not to be associated with Pervos. Yes. The same kind of image, right? So he comes back on, on a plane from Germany after having been saved after the assassination attempt. And everybody sees him, not like Vladimir Lenin, he's a totally different person, but like the person who could spearhead a revolution. And that's what he's saying he's going to do. He's saying, I want to be president. And he's unbelievably brave. He's got this moral courage. The Putin and people know that people admire that. And so that even if people don't agree with Navalny, they maybe don't sort of support him politically, that courage is infectious because courage can be just as infectious as fear. And Putin trades in fear and Navalny and Ilya and Vladimir, they actually, they trade in courage. And that's kind of in they basically say to everyone, they can't kill all of you. They can't put everyone in jail. They're in the jail. It's very, you know, right out of uh, Brothers Karamazov and, you know, the, the Grand Inquisitor. They're sitting in there to be punished for everybody else. So unfortunately, I don't think that in this case of this acute phase of this war, there's much chance of getting him out there. Brittany Griner, Paul Whelan, they're pawns in Russia's game. I think Russia would like to trade, but I don't think they want to trade anyone for Navalny and the others at this particular point, because Putin is too scared of having them out there. Because Mikhail Khodorkovsky, he sat in a penal colony for 11 years. And remember, Putin decided that maybe he was broken by this point. And, that, and it was prior to the Olympics, yeah. Exactly. And that, you know, there was, it was uh, Genscher, the former foreign minister of Germany, and, uh, and others who helped to um, remove him. And Putin says in a very Dostoevskyan moment, well, he's suffered enough, but it was 11 <coughs> years of having, you know, kind of getting TB, having all kinds of horrible things happen to him. Being his mom was and dying, and Putin, was dying. Yeah. And Putin decided mm -hmm. to, you know, do the mercy of the Tsar. But by this point, he'd assessed that Hodokovsky wasn't going to be a threat. And Hodokovsky had agreed to stay out of the country, even though he mobilized and has actually been, you know, an effective voice on the outside. Putin didn't think he could mobilize people internally in the way that he right. might have done. But these guys can. The very last question so from that, that is a very negative response to a question, but I think that's unfortunately where we are. And there is no way that you know that the United States government can trade them for sanctions or for something. As I said before, I don't think the sanctions, even if they were lifted, that people would go back. Putin's not going to get, you know, the kind of relief or the turnaround in the economy that he might be. The what the, the, the full on attention internationally to this but we've had you know what have we done we haven't succeeded in iran you know we haven't succeeded in it was very difficult in north korea right. uh, which is very different very sort of transactional turkey um you know some of my colleagues uh, and friends from um you know working on turkey for years are in jail they've been giving life sentences people are you know follow um uh, 
colleagues at Brookings, you know, for example, because they've, you know, kind of got crosswise with Erdogan. It's the same thing, you know, fears of, you know, political opposition and, and, and having to stifle it, having to decapitate the, the, the opposition. But, you know, if everybody keeps at it, if there's, you know, pressure from every particular front as part of those constraints, it's possible. But the, the, let's just say the circumstances are not propitious, I'm afraid. Last question from my side. TV radio, the only independent Russian language cable network in exile, was deprived of license in Riga, Latvia yesterday. Lithuania followed the suit. According to its editor, Tikhon Zitko, TV Rain has an audience of 18 million people, yeah. Russian speaking population inside and outside Russia. All Russians, whom I know in Moscow, do watch TV Rain, as it is the only source of information because everything else is just opinions, 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 opinions. They provide information about yeah. the war in Ukraine, about what's happening uh, with a Russian army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everything else is just hearsay. Uh, yet, uh, even human rights activists in the United States argue that, you know, uh, they, they can be dangerous for uh, Baltic nations. What is your take on that? This is one of those incredibly difficult dilemmas that I think we have to you know, have a very open and you know, frank discussion about. Because again, you know, we're in a wartime scenario. There's all the worries about misinformation and disinformation. Uh, but there's also, I mean, as you're pointing out, and you've been in this um, situation yourself as an independent journalist and, you know, your work with Echo Moskvi and the New Times and everything, it's very important to have objective information out there. But it also has to be authentic. And this is, you know, where the line got crossed there talking about Nashi, ours, because the, you know, Russians, the, the attempt to make appeal to Russians in you know, difficult circumstances, they find themselves in the midst of a war. But of course, you know, for all the rest of us, this is a war that was perpetrated by Putin and being enabled, you know, by... Fiona, this you know, army, and, and it I'm didn't just, come from Mars or Lunar. I'm, just, I'm responsible for this army because they're Russian citizens. That's, I bear responsibility that's, for what they do. That's what I was just about to say, Jenny. I was basically saying that the difficulty that, you know, we have here is that we have the journalist basically trying to kind of find a way of making a kind of a common cause with Russians by talking about ours, our army, but in a way in which, uh, as he's explained it, he was trying to, you know, make it more palatable the things that he was saying. But as you're saying here, very clearly from the moral point of view, that's already going across the line because this military operation is an abomination. So we're in that kind of dilemma that we have now here, as you were saying, you have 18 million people who are listening to this, who are trying to get information about the war and about what's happening. The journalists are trying to sort of engage and there's this line all the time in which we have to be extraordinarily careful not to cross. And I, I think, you know, this is something particularly with journalists like yourself and others, that we have to have a debate about this and to kind of try to figure out. I, you know, myself have been reading it very carefully and just trying to think about, okay, how do you handle this? Because it's absolutely clear that nobody in Russia should be in this motion in the front, and hundreds of thousands of people have left. You know, there could be advice about how you leave, how you leave the front, how you you know get out of the country. And you know, the argument of the journalists, of course, is it was trying to find a way of giving people kind of information when they're being put in you know very risky uh, situations. But if they were trying to get information, you have to make people to write to you and to be willing to provide you information. That's exactly what they were trying. They were trying to extract information from this black box by the name Russian army. It's extremely difficult to get information from that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. We're in an incredibly difficult dilemma here. And I'm, I'm myself- And I would say that in this country, here. people you know, have experience of that. There was time when the United States uh, conducted a war of aggression and a war well, of choice in, in Vietnam. Vietnam. Exactly, exactly. exactly. No, so we're in that Vietnam phase. Russia is in, it's, you know, it's Vietnam phase. And, you know, I have friends and, you know, people I know really well who were defectors, you know, went up to Canada, which, you know, is a bit different from, you know, kind of some of the other things that are happening now, but others who were in the anti-war movement as well. I mean, maybe people sitting in here have a direct experience of that. And it was something that, you know, ripped, the country apart and i also think this is what's going to happen in russia and this is going to rip them apart and this debate and this scandal around dodge is going to be part of that because it's it's showing the impossibility of squaring that circle 
I mean, I'm trying to explain for the audience if people of course. are following it about, you know, what the journalist said that he was, he was trying to do. That he was trying to kind of make a connection so that he could pass on information by, you know, fellow kind of feeling, but, you know, obviously from the perspective of... Latin, and country which how, is a how, member how, of the European you, Union with their legs. How you fellow feeling with an army that has been sent into an illegal, you know, war of aggression here, you, you know, and you're doing this, you know, from our territory. So they pulled the license, there's going to be a whole debate. And I said, we have to debate this and talk about it, but they're absolutely right. I think the parallel with Vietnam is very apt here. Sure, you understand that. People in Kremlin, so they're drinking champagne. It was the best present to them, you know. This European Union country showed its real attitude towards the freedom of the because press. Because I'm saying there's no longer any of freedom of the press and everything else. Yeah, so this is the, the, I don't think the journalists did this on the part of the Kremlin, but it's, it's opening up the whole, but it's how we handle it next, how we talk about it, how we lay out um, all of the, those dilemmas. Because I do think, and look, you're here and, you know, we are in NYU, people are trying to figure out how do we engage with the Russians who are not in support of the war. Because there is also a tendency now to try to you know, push back. And I'm We're sure Germans of 1945, exactly right. absolutely. How, how do you engage those? This That's how I be, feel. This is gonna be a big mm -hmm. question for the future. But you know, I think we should feel uh, that badly, to be honest with you. I do think that all of us, uh, opposition, not opposition, all of us were responsible for what Putin is doing because this is our country and we allowed uh, him to do this. So Ukrainians are paying for that with their lives. You know, uh, children are dead, you know, thousands and thousands of civilians are dead. So of course we are responsible and it's, it, it's no fun uh, to be a, a Russian now. But I think it's very important for Russians to understand that this is our responsibility. Yeah. I will stop here and uh, yes, please. Uh, first, I would like to take questions from, from, uh, from students. Guys, this is university, that's what's important. Yes. Are we, are we okay for time here with your yeah. Zoom? Your Zoom session doesn't just end, does it? We, I have no, no, the Zoom session okay? just goes. Yeah, if you're okay, you know. thank you. Thank well, you very much for this. Zoom says your Zoom session. Sure, and it's imagine. once in a lifetime yeah. event, so yeah. no, no, it's okay. Yeah. So please. Please name yourself. Hi, I'm Anastasia. Thank you so much. It was incredible. Uh, I'm a Ukrainian refugee. Just got here a few months ago. So my main question: What your prediction for the future? When is it going to end? And how is it going to end? Like, is it going to be a frozen conflict? Is it going to be a great victory, which we all like desire? Or yeah, and I just want to say. You know, I'm sorry, I am sure on behalf of everyone else here on stage as well, that this is just devastating and I'm glad you're here. And, you know, really hope that all of your family are going to be okay. Um, I can't tell you how it's going to end. I mean, I really wish I could. Um, but all of it will depend on all of us, right? Um, because as I was trying to explain, it's not just Ukraine's war. It's, uh, you know, kind of, we're all involved in this. And we're part of the, the home front, you know, in the war as it were as well. Um, we're going to have to deal with wartime economy and all, all of the knock-on effects. And we also have a moral responsibility in the United States and the United Kingdom in particular, because in 1994, we promised Ukraine, uh, when Ukraine gave up the strategic nuclear arsenal that it inherited from the Soviet Union, that we would give assurances. They were very clear on what that meant. Well, that but I, think, really. I think we are stepping up now and you know giving those assurances as well as concrete help that if there was any threat to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, look, Russia and took that as well and clearly violated that, that we would be there. So the United States and the UK, if anybody is asking, you know, why are we doing this? Well, we actually do have a direct responsibility and I'm a dual citizen of both countries. So absolutely, we have a responsibility there. But it's also all the knock-on effects. I mean, all the things that are happening to you, we said that this would never happen again in Europe and it's happening again. The atrocities that we saw in World War II, the atrocities we saw in World War I, the annexation of um, territory, this is unacceptable. So we can't let it happen in the way that Putin wants it to happen. Putin would love a frozen conflict because he said they could sort of drink champagne behind the lines. He talks about this like Korea, the DMZ, you know, the demilitarized zone, uh, the territory that um, is being taken would stay there, the suffering and carnage would, uh, would continue, and there would be, you know, kind of uh, just the continued destruction of Ukraine, the inability of Ukraine to move forward. Putin has also said that, you know, the best scenario from Ukraine from his perspective is like Finland, you see this being seeded out there, in the sense that Finland got its independence again, after the winter war, but it left without Karelia and basically all the territory. So one way or another, Putin is determined 
to take Ukraine's territory. And again, we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the only way that that doesn't happen, and there's a different end game, is to keep up on what we're doing. So more, all these discussions that we're all having, everybody should be out there talking about this and not forgetting about this, because we're all affected by this directly as well as not, not just indirectly. Then we also have to keep up, you're here in um, New York, engaging with people you know within the United Nations, people from every country imaginable. I just said, you go out and talk to everyone you know from everywhere imaginable, because this sets precedence for everyone's future here. And the United Nations and you know, keeping that support for Ukraine in the General Assembly is a constraint on Putin and Russia. That used to be in um, the arena where Russia with the veto in the Security Council could really have its own way, the United States and China and you know, others as well. But it was really kind of an arena in which Russia played and making it more and more difficult uh, for Russia to do this is very important. The other thing is, I mean, again, it's just constantly keeping it in the spotlight, as I sort of said here, and just being honest about this. And then the other thing is, like, over the long term, how to engage with Russians like Jenny and others who see the deep responsibility here. You know, let's not cancel every Russian who wants to see something different as well. If a million people have left Russia, that's a million people that we can work with to try to push for something different. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with Putin, but the more that he looks like he's lost in this war, and I think he already has lost because he didn't have his special military operation. He's lost morally. He's lost strategically. I mean, it may not. It's, 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 it's a you know kind of a, a strange you know kind of victory you know, if he you know tries to call it that way. But there's a, a massive loss for Russia as well here. And the more that that becomes clear, the more likely it is that others around him might react as well. I mean, there's a lot of criticism from calling it Putin's war. And as the view says, there's a lot of responsibility in everybody's part. I mean, just like the United States, there's responsibility in Vietnam and any other you know, issues, invasion of Iraq you know, back in 2003, for example. But the more that it's seen as Putin's war, the more that it's possible for others to decide to end it. So I think we have to also you know, keep on in the diplomacy, trying to figure out who might be there. I and mean, you've got a lot of you know, insights into the people in the circles around Putin who might be you know, willing at some point to put this on a different track. You know, Lenin ended the World War I with Brest Tosk because he had a you know, whole uh, different idea. Alexander you know, the second, when he came after Nicholas the first, you know, it was the end of the Crimean War and he emancipated the Serbs. You know, there was a, a, the, the Cold War ended because Gorbachev wanted to do something different and we didn't expect him to back in 1985. Right. It's not impossible that someone could decide to do something different. We have to give them incentives to do that as well. So we also have to you know, focus on how can we influence Russians? Obviously, TV, Dost, and there's kind of a crisis now, but how can we find avenues and pathways you know, to influence Russians to take responsibility, as Genia said, and to try to end this as well? It shouldn't all be on Ukraine and Ukrainians to uh, basically see this through. It's on us as well. I mean, I personally feel responsible. That's why I'm here to talk to everyone. You feel responsible. And I think everyone here in this room should feel a sense of responsibility as well, because you know, we owe it to you and to ourselves uh, to, to see this through um, in, a, in a different way, to make a different kind of uh, end game from the one that Putin wants. Thank you so much for this one. No, well, thank you. Yes, thank Please. you. Juan, what do you see? Would you please introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Wilson. I'm okay. the president of New York. Mm. Okay. Uh, number one, prospect of like a coup d'etat or assassination of Putin within like a revolt within the circle. Is there any chance of that? And number two, with the new House Republicans, do you think there will be a change of policy in terms of money and uh, you know, sending money to Ukraine to defend themselves? And uh, Trump running again, and if he wins in 2024, do you think he'll roll back you know, all the support and like, dismantle NATO or still uh, supporting NATO? So that's kind of predictive question. Well, I mean, if he runs again um, in 2024, I mean, I doubt that that's going to be part of his campaign. He certainly won't be talking about foreign policy. I mean, he didn't really the last time. I think he's saying if he wins you know, yeah. again in 2024, well, it depends on you know, a lot of uh, different uh, factors there. I think there'll be a big backlash in the United States if he wins again. I mean, this is a person who's asked for the suspension of the Constitution, um, who, you know, basically instigated violence in January 6th. And I don't know whether the United States will count itself out of global affairs 
uh, in 2024 as a result of that. I mean, you know, it's not just the United States that operates in this world, getting back to Anastasia's question. You know, the Europeans, uh, there's a lot of, you know, Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, there's lots of other you know, countries that are out there now that are extraordinarily worried about what's happening in Ukraine. And the United States just might just count itself out. Uh, and the 2024 is still, you know, two years off. So well, I suppose it's actually one year and a bit off, uh, but when the election is actually two years off, though, actually, because it's November, isn't it, that uh, we're talking about? Yeah. But, you know, there's also has to be an election in Russia in 2024. And this gets back to, you know, you your first question. Here. I know, but I was going to say, you know, it's got all a re and a reappointment of uh, self by Putin, who was always just running against his past selves. But the fact is, if he's looking like he's a failure uh, in Ukraine and the economy is on the way down, you know, the kind of question is about, you know, how easy it will be for him just to consolidate. And this is really where Eugenia is, a, a, is an expert on this as well. You know, are there, will there be others who might want to kind of push him, you know, off into a different direction? And a lot of that will, again, depend on, you know, what he looks like, not just domestically, but internationally. Is he completely as a pariah? Now, you know, right now, China is maybe a little bit more equivocal uh, about its uh, support for, you know, the war and the conflict. In the Middle East, they've all sort of, you know, as I mentioned before, doubled down on, on all of this. The Saudis, Iranians, you know, there's seeing a lot of advantage for this here. But, you know, this has really put Russia on a completely and utterly different track. So it will really depend beyond the party of war, what all the oligarchs, business people, people like yourself, the million will be more people leaving. Will there be real rumbles of discontent? Um, you know, there, there, could, there could be a change. I mean, I'd be interested to see, you know, what you're thinking yourself, Virginia. It may be more difficult you know, for Putin to, you know, continue on, on the way that he has two years from now. And, and although, as Jenny is obviously rightly pointing out, 2024 will not be a real election, it is an inflection point in the system where, technically speaking, Putin has to be reaffirmed by, you know, the population. Because, you know, he would never suspend the constitution because the constitution is what makes him, you know, an autocrat, uh, the, the Russian constitution, no political party. Uh, and, and his base is supposed to be, you know, the whole population, the narrow, the, 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 the entire population of Russia. And if, you know, his, his support is really only in the 20s or 30 percent, he's in trouble. I mean, at least in terms of being able to say to others that I am the most popular person. Because, you know, his, in the past, his popular support has been genuinely stratospheric, especially after the annexation of Crimea. And he expected that another quick, amazing, victorious war, Ukraine in the fold, along with Belarus, maybe a whole new union state, and he kind of you know, as the Tsar of the Ruski Mir or whatever it is he was going to kind of call this, Novi Rasiya, Yuzhne Rasiya, he's got all of these different terminologies out there. Well, that hasn't really worked out as planned. <coughs> so I think we have to watch all of this very carefully. And again, keep that pressure up, keep those constraints and make it, you know, less likely that, you know, that we go in the direction of the thrust of your comments. I can't speak to a coup. Um, they have happened before in um, Russian history and in Soviet history, there's been soft coups. Khrushchev ended up in a dacha in a long time. Uh, Gorbachev had two coups against him. And, you know, just recently, you know, died a uh, somewhat peaceful, but, you know, kind of, he was in ill health, but, you know, had a very long life, a, a natural death. I'm not sure that Vladimir Putin, you know, is kind of, um, you know, likely to have the same outcome as Khrushchev and, uh, and, Gorbachev, because he's really stood the pot up here. There was and another he himself, case when Beria was shot. Just, but I was thinking about these. That's why I was kind of hesitating a little there. Putin himself is incredibly worried about this. So, you know, the more we talk about that, the more worried he gets, you know, particularly this <laughs> ends up on Japanese television or, you know, wherever it is that, you know, we end up now. He'll be thinking that someone somewhere is thinking about this. And in fact, he's probably thinking every single moment that someone somewhere is thinking about this at home or abroad. So he's doing everything that he possibly can to make sure that that does not happen. Guys, this is part of the record. Clear? We agreed on that. This is off the record. Although Thank we you. are on Zoom. But... It's okay. A zoom and Zoom. <laughs> but it's not okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi. Okay. Okay. Uh, Riley Hester, I'm a master's student here at NYU in Russian oh, and Slavic studies, um, and I hope you don't mind me reading my question. Oh, please go ahead. But, um, as we watch the war un uh, unfold online, I'm thinking back to the early fact checking from US sources on Russian di disinformation campaigns, and I was wondering if you can comment your take on the role of social media in this war. 
Oh, wow, the role of social media has been so varied. I mean, in, in one you know, way, of course, it is the vehicle for lots of disinformation, but it's also the vehicle for incredible amounts of information. I mean, this is the first world war, I'm, I'm meeting on this you know, kind of global scale of a great power conflict that we've all seen in real time. I mean, I have to stop myself going on YouTube because you know, I could be there all day you know, watching all kinds of, it's information overload. And so, I mean, that, that's another thing, getting back to, you know, point, we're all watching what's happening in real time. You know, back in the day of World War One, my granny had a box uh, of, you know, kind of letters that friends sent back from the front. And, you know, some of them never, you know, arrived after the war was ended. They had dispatches and they could take, you know, days and weeks to come. In the World War Two, there was those reels that were sent around to give people updates on uh, the, uh, from the war in the cinema. But they were, you know, so, you know, behind the times of, of the information, people hearing reports you know, so far after it's happened, we see things in real time at this moment. And that, in a way, also makes it harder for Putin and others to hide behind the facts. Yes, they can put out propaganda and disinformation and, you know, misdirect, but we can also see a lot of information and make decisions for ourselves. We think about investigative journalists like Virginia, but also Bellingcat, you know, and the, and the group uh, who were there and just the incredible information that they've revealed. I mean, just when the, the, the US uh, Bill Burns and the intelligence services were out making reports on the war, you could see yourself. You could go on Google Earth and look about you know, where the, yep. the troops were massed on the borders. We could all see that. And so, I mean, everybody can be really a kind of an intelligence expert. You just have to be, you know, self kind of balancing off all of that information that you're getting in social media, verifying your own sources, checking them, double checking them. You know, making sure that some things haven't been faked. I mean, we've seen a lot of fake videos out there as well. But I think all of us in real time can track this wall. And as a result of that, we can also, you know, call things to account. So social media is a powerful tool, both on the negative side and on the positive side of the, of the, of the ledger. It's really transformed, you know, the world in which we're operating. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Edward. Hey, Edward. Um, and I wanted to ask you if, and you said that Putin is considering the use of a tactical news. He, he has considered it. Let's just put it that way. If, and in a hypothetical scenario, if he does end up using the new on NATO territory or not, do you think the European states would risk retaliating and losing everything? Or do you think they would um, exercise restraint in the United States, even if Russia has used the nuclear weapon? Well, if he used if he used a nuclear weapon on NATO territory, it would immediately trigger a response. So um, I don't think he's contemplated. I mean, he's obviously probably fantasized about this, and some of his military have at different points or under certain scenarios. We've seen them do their military planning, where they um, usually envisage a kind of a, a local conflict, which is could have been in Belarus or Ukraine, like we're seeing now, and where they see a NATO intervention directly in that conflict. That's why the US government's been extraordinarily careful not to send in troops, and then you might engage in a nuclear exchange. What he's been talking about is the use of a nuclear weapon in Ukraine itself in the battlefield, which would have casualties and have an impact, but wouldn't have the kind of effects that you're talking about, because he was trying, in a way, to flush out an answer to that question. Because Putin's trying to figure out, which he always has at every time, what is the, our red lines? What are our thresholds? And we are basically telling him what those are behind the scenes. So one of the things is to be very careful about what you talk about in public. As I said before, he's engaging in a psychological operation to scare everyone. So when he's saying nuclear war has never been closer, what he's trying to portray is a kind of a Cold War-like scenario where it was part of the Soviet and US doctrine to use nuclear weapons in a great power superpower exchange. We're not there. Putin has invaded his neighboring country of Ukraine and he's threatening this to get all of us to go, oh my God, nuclear war, we've got to stop this immediately. And in fact, that's what the Pope and that's what a lot of other leaders are basically saying, the risk of nuclear war is too great, so we must immediately hand Ukraine over uh, to Russia or basically have a negotiation on Putin's terms. So what he's trying to do is, is, is basically flesh all of this out, get all of us to talk about uh, the, the, the risk and the prospects of, of, of nuclear war by raising the, the idea of the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Euro Missile Crisis or a major superpower conflict. But the United States is not talking about doing that. NATO is not talking about doing that. We have not at any point, just to be a thousand percent clear, talked about any kind of nuclear exchange with Russia. In fact, 
we've been asking uh, Russia to engage in strategic um, nuclear talks, and, and the Russians have pulled out of it because Putin wants to keep messing about and yeah. talking about um, nuclear war. So I'm not jumping all over you. I'm just trying to be kind of clear about you know what Putin himself is trying to do here, because he wants us all to think that nuclear war is a real possibility, but. We're not in the 1980s in a superpower conflict. And the United States has made it very clear that we are not contemplating in any way any kind of nuclear exchange with Russia over Ukraine. And, and the Ukrainians, you know, obviously, you know, the, themselves are you know, being battered and destroyed by all kinds of conventional um, forces. And they are actually using nuclear capable missiles, the Russians are, but with, you know, conventional um, you know, basically explosive on them. And so, so Putin is, is, is trying to tie us all up in nuclear knots at the moment, which again, I just want to be very clear that doesn't mean that we should disregard all of this, but we have to be very clear on what he's doing and why he's doing it. And again, if he could really scare the heck out of us by using a tactical nuclear weapon, which would obviously kill you know, soldiers and civilians, but have a you know, limited uh, range of damage, but of course there'd be risks of you know, kind of radioactive you know, material, and look, we've already seen him threaten the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, the largest nuclear plant in Europe, go through the Chernobyl nuclear zone, in fact, stirring up, you know, nuclear dust. He's an all, you know, kind of uh, every issue nuclear menace at the moment. I mean, he's basically weaponized nuclear power plants as well, because he wants us to be scared. And he knows that in places like Japan, after the Fukushima accident, and in Germany, you know, because of their, you know, uh, complete concerns about uh, nuclear weapons, and you know, also raising Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and everybody thinking about the devastation and the horrors of that, and how we also we would never use nuclear weapons again. He wants us all to think about it. And in many of the, um, you know, Russian commentators, I mean, people that you know we've worked with in the past, people like Dmitry Trenin and you know others, have all said the West needs to remember nuclear deterrence because basically Putin wants to get his way conventionally by deterring us from intervening and continuing to support Ukraine because we, he wants us to worry about the threat of a nuclear exchange. And it's really one hand clapping or slapping in this case. So Putin is basically saying, let's have a discussion about nuclear weapons because then Ukraine becomes less important. It's not about Ukraine, it's about something else. Yes, please. Hi, I'm, uh, Diana. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm an Italian journalist. Um, I want to ask you, how worried uh, are the United States about the possibility that, uh, one, um, this uh, increased attacks within, like counterattacks in a way, within Russian territory, um, that in response to the bombardment of the infrastructure from the Ukrainians could lead to any kind of escalation. Um, and also, how worried are they that if Putin unilaterally declares a truce, uh, that could divide NATO members, uh, especially the ones who are farther away, that are farther away from the front line. Could you could you explain what you mean by an escalation? Because we're already in an escalation. I mean, the Russians yeah. are pummeling, you know, kind of Ukraine, yeah, you know, without any... Actually, um, a, a, like a, an interesting um, thing too. Uh, I am not sure what I mean. I'm, I'm, I, I think that- Because <laughs> yeah, we, we all talk about escalation, yes, but we, we don't know what we mean, about, right? Yes, right, yeah. we all talk about escalation and we think, you know, Macron and Biden, they agree with the risk of an escalation, but we don't really know what it looks like. I mean, what so we're trying to avoid is a direct exchanges between guess, you know NATO and the United States and Russia itself. Yeah, um, you know, the Ukrainians can take this to the United Nations elsewhere. Under you know the rules of war, Ukraine has the absolute right to take out military installations that are targeting it. And you know I don't think we have full information the Ukrainians are being you know not really saying you know one way or another and you know whether they've been you know targeting um, these military airfields. I mean we're assuming that they have. But these are, you know, legitimate nuclear, uh, military targets. I said nuclear there by accident. Military targets, and of course, you know, we we've seen this happen in many other conflicts as well. And you know, we think about you know Syria when there was the the red line. I mean, under the I mean the Trump administration, the United States along with France and the United Kingdom, you know, did agree to take out airfields in Syria that had been, um, you know, the the origins of the use of chemical weapons and other countries supported that as well. So it's kind of totally possible that Ukraine can get, you know, kind of agreement in, in the UN and the General Assembly that what it's doing is legitimate. 
Now, in terms of escalation, I mean, the Russians are escalating anywhere in the um, attacks on Ukraine, although there is still some restraint, it doesn't seem like there is, but, uh, you know, there is, there is some, you know, kind of ways in which they're being uh, somewhat cautious in what they're using. It may also be that they're, you know, they're running out of, you know, certain um, armaments. Uh, but their intention is to, well, I mean, to destroy all the critical infrastructure so the Ukrainians can't survive the winter. You know, as you're saying about weaponizing winter, because Putin, you know, knows it's back to Napoleon and, you know, all the, the, and the World War II and the German invasions and everyone getting bogged down in winter. And Ukraine, of course, actually, that was the territory where you, um, the, the uh, Napoleon's forces and the German forces went across and they froze to death in Ukrainian territory as well as in, you know, uh, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation itself. And Putin's always, you know, talking about the, the reliance on winter and freezing people to death. I mean, lots of people to freeze in Italy and freeze in, you know, Germany and freeze in the United Kingdom. And you know, my role is in the United Kingdom, turn their fires off and, you know, electricity off, you know, as well to conserve energy. So this is part of, you know, a deliberate strategy for Putin, which is to, you know, weaponize absolutely everything he can and to create a sense of escalation using, you know, the kind of the nuclear threats and everything else, so that he can get people fearful. So people say, just exactly uh, what you're saying, let's have a ceasefire. We need to have a ceasefire, we need to end this, and then exactly to split. He wants to have happen what you're asking the question about. He wants to split NATO, he wants to split Europe, he wants to split popular opinion in the United States and elsewhere, because he wants to have a fight about whether Ukraine should continue to be supported. So he's trying to basically deflect attention on every possible occasion. Uh, and you know, we have to talk about this if we know what he's trying to do. And yes, there, there will be, you know, there's a lot of opinion polls that are being doing, uh, are being done, the European Council of Foreign Relations and others, for example, talking about people want peace at all costs or justice, you know, justice for Ukraine and the peace camp, you know, wanting it to stop and, you know, wanting, you know, the, the, to be a ceasefire and just to have this all ended. Well, you can have a just peace, you know, the, these sort of things don't have to be um, exclusive, but it shouldn't be on Vladimir Putin's terms. And that's what the, you know, US government and UK government and many others are saying as well. And I think, you know, in Italy, you know, obviously where, where you're from, there's, you know, if you talk to Italian diplomats and others, they don't want to see that either. Because this is not a world that any of us want to live in, where Vladimir Putin is setting an example for how you can leverage pretty much absolutely everything to get your own way. And then we will be then in a world with very different rules. And it's not just about China that everybody <clears throat> thinks about, but it's just, you know, overall, the world that we live in. Force and, you know, might will make right um, if Putin gets away with all of this. And, you know, we, we won't be able to roll that back again. So when people say, you know, Ukraine is fighting for all of us, they're, they're right. Because it's, it's kind of the world that we want to live in. You know, when we look for, you know, further forward, There's, we're not going back to February 23rd after this, even if, even if you know, the, 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 there's a ceasefire call tomorrow, we're, there's no going back to where we were before. The world has moved on and we've got to figure out in ourselves, which is why it's important to have you, know, you and others writing about this, about how we conduct ourselves, how we keep this together uh, so that we can have a different end game from the one that you know, basically we were talking about with Anastasia. I hate to say that unfortunately we have to wrap up here you know I really you know I, I understand that it's amazing conversation thank you very much to Fiona Hill for giving all this time and answering questions and being so sincere in her answers and so you know I mean you see that she's an incredible analyst incredible uh, she has incredible knowledge about the world politics so we're lucky to have her here thank you very much no, thank you very much. I mean, yeah. Thank you.